Uh, it's pretty much about nationalism for the most part. And so you've got some movements that are trying to unify, and some movements where you're trying to like, unify common uh, cultures or ethnic groups, like Germans and Italians, and you've got others that are trying to separate away from it. Um, quick reminder, go ahead and put all the phones and uh, um, tablets and all that, clothes and them away, whatnot. Um, so, yeah, trying to unify common ethnicities, or you're trying to uh, break away from imperial control by a different one. Um, pretty much all of them are going to be taking place during the 19th century that we talked about. There's a few in the early 20th century that it bleeds over a little bit, but not much. Um, why all of a sudden are people wanting to change borders, like uh, political borders? What you got? Yeah, they, they don't like their feudal states or religious states. They want to reform them to make states that are like uh, more ethnically, uh, pure is definitely not the word I want to use, more ethnically homogenous. There we go. Uh, is the word that was probably a better one. But that's impossible to do, by the way, because you've always got little populations of minority groups in there, so that's going to be a problem um, from the 18, late 19th century and then all the way to World War II, as we all know, with... Uh, with the uh, communist regimes, um, and then uh, of course the Nazis and fascist regimes. What were you going to say? Or did she steal your thunder? <laughs> then she probably <laughs> she probably stole your thunder. Then oh, I need a pen for that. But yeah, um, so they are wanting to, of course, um, get rid of these old identifications based on their feudal ties uh, or even religion, perhaps, uh, and make it a more ethnic, racially, language-based. Um, state. Who started this tendency for people to all of a sudden want to do this? And yeah, let's, let's do it like at that. France, and because they saw the, how powerful a, a nation could be. They did, and then uh, who else? Did, they didn't just impact France, they impacted a lot of other areas too, but do you remember why? Uh, oh, Napoleon Civic Code, how it spread out? Yeah, they didn't like uh, the French imposing their culture and, and, and traditions onto them. They wanted to sort of choose their own, right? So he actually, Napoleon, by making this empire, kind of creates or stirs up these national identities uh, elsewhere, especially when he, uh, he and other revolutions chased out some of those traditional leaders, okay? All right, Germany's going to be uh, uh, one area that's uh, greatly impacted by this that wants to form their own sort of identity. Um, what, what role did the revolutions of 1830 and 1848 what, how, what did they show us about nationalism? Because remember, almost all of them failed, but what did it show us? Because they were different kinds of revolutions. And they weren't coordinated either. They just popped up around the same time when the word spread. What did that show us about nationalism and uh, the old traditional you know, feudal system? Yeah, uh, it's at this point, it's too. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's spread too deeply into the culture of uh, Europeans after uh, after Napoleon. So the revolution of 1830, 1848, uh, some of them do work, right? Like uh, in Belgium uh, and a couple others. But for the most part, it shows that people are no longer willing to be subjected to uh, the the old feudal system uh, or even just monarchies, right? Because some of them aren't necessarily nationalistic, but they're liberal because they want to get rid of those. Uh, noble and monarchical uh, strangleholds on power. They want regular people becoming involved too. All right, so nationalism, uh, it's kind of driven uh, by French conquests of Napoleon. And again, it's an, uh, an urge to form a state of common race, language, culture, etc. Uh, we know that, and then we've seen evidence that the, uh, the feudalism is kind of on its way out because of all these uh, large-scale revolutions that are, that are spreading uh, in 1830 and 1848 uh, showcase the, uh, the decline of the feudal system. Okay, um, 
Oh, I was gonna ask something else about that. Oh no, I don't think you guys found any notes. Maybe you have actually. Actually, I think it's on page 36. Does anybody know the, uh, there were several people like this. You could, you could choose any one country or culture and you could find some uh, prolific writer that wanted to, you know, aspire to unite the people of their race or language and, and make a great kingdom. Uh, do you guys remember who the German was that really uh, wrote many uh, nationalistic poems and encouraged people to unite based on their uh, German identity to form an empire and spread and all, all that? Johann Fichte. Yeah, Johann Fichte, yeah, Johann Fichte. So um, it's not just him, but he, he's one that embodies uh, the kind of the movement. So uh, nationalist writers, like Johann Fichte in Germany. Fichte. Uh, they're going to advocate um, national national identities. Okay, and the last thing I want to I want to make sure we got this clear. Why do I say people want either nationalist reforms or liberal reforms? And again, that means enlightenment. Why do I separate separate the two categories? Why isn't nationalism lumped in with liberalism or or enlightenment uh, ideals? Why would that be? Actually, you were first. Because they fall more like in, um, nationalism falls more as a romanticism movement, and uh, why is that not enlightenment? Because it's focused more on emotions and one's own people instead of like mixing with everyone else, others like race, religions, ethnicities. Yeah. Um, how does how does uh, nationalism feel about humans? I'm sticking with you if you can, because I want I want a little more of the answer. Because you're you're not wrong, but it's a little vague. So yeah. like, how does nationalism view human beings? As opposed to how does the Enlightenment view human beings? Nationalism views more people like separated on their like on different ethnicities and races. Yeah. So, and uh, like nationalist people, I like, think they're racist, more superior than other people. Okay, there you go. And then how does the Enlightenment see humans? It just views it views us as humans who are trying to like better better human society. What? How does it explain certain cultures doing better than others? Does it care about that? No. Not necessarily. Do you remember how it feels about that? You're doing really good. I'm giving you at least two for that. Can you can you cap it off and get a third by explaining that one, maybe? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so, nationalism would say, oh, we're doing better because we're the best people. That's what it pretty much says, right? We're superior to other humans. It's not just a, uh, you know, a factor of, of chance or, you know, including other cultures over time. How does the Enlightenment explain this very degree of cultural success? Because it doesn't say it's because they're superior people, whereas nationalism does. Do you remember why, or how they see it? No. Okay, that's fine. If they see some other culture doing better, they're gonna try to implement whatever they're doing better into their own culture. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah. It, it, the term I was looking for is cultural relativism, but yeah, that kind of explains it. So they realize that certain cultures may do better at certain times, and they all have accomplishments that are worth praising. Uh, but you shouldn't see that as a result of one culture or race being superior. It's just these circumstances cause these ideas to become uh, popular or successful. So we as humans should embrace them because we're all humans that are equally capable of, of learning and, and all of that. All right. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, and again, let's not forget that this is a, it is a counter-enlightenment, a romantic movement. Right, so all these nationalist conflicts, including World War, all the way up to World War One, imperialism, all of these are examples not of the Enlightenment. They're actually uh, examples of nationalism and romanticism uh, or, or counter-Enlightenment motives. So counter-Enlightenment movement. And what we mean by that is they see their culture or race as superior. And hey, if I see my culture or race as superior to other people, what does that make it okay to do from my perspective, if I believe that? What does that make it okay to do? Colonize and um, actually like, rule over them. Yeah, exactly. Imperialize them, right. Uh, whether it's forming a colony or just taking over another country or, or, or dictating their economy and what they can buy and sell, right. That's going to help lead to uh, imperialism and social Darwinism later, right. So see their culture is uh, or race is superior uh, and it's nationalism. And this is going to uh, help justify imperialism coming up later. Justify. Imperialism. All right. Um, enlightenment would not be. If you actually went down the tenets of the Enlightenment, they would not advocate imperializing the world uh, or going over to war or going to war over issues like religion or national identity. 
All right, they're, they're more about cosmopolitanism and accepting people as people who are capable of improvement, uh, and, and that's what would be their focus. So this is very much a counter-enlightenment movement. The reason why I can mention that is, you're probably like, who cares, why do you keep drilling this on this fact? Um, because for some reason, people have erroneously associated the Enlightenment with imperialism. Uh, and it's really, it's quite popular in uh, universities and in the social sciences right now, and it's not actually accurate. All right, this is, a, this is an offshoot of the counter-enlightenment. All right, all the stuff that Germany's trying to do during this era, later the United States is trying to do, France is trying to do, all these countries are trying to do, and increase their national uh, holdings, that's not the Enlightenment, that's nationalism, it's the opposite of uh, the Enlightenment. All right, so that's actually the first slide, I think, plus more from a uh, uh, notebook page, whatever the next one is, it's 36 or whatever. Um, now let's actually continue with uh, this one. So the, uh, the name of the game here is in the 19th century and the early 20th century, either unite my uh, uh, fractured states that are similar or break away from some other ethnic group that's controlling me. All right, we talked about that last week too. So unification is gonna be focused in the German regions and Italian regions and breaking away from um, uh, control by another ethnic group is gonna be happening a lot here in Austria and the Balkans, uh, not Russia so much right now. Um, and even France, they're not gonna be trying to break away from anything, but they're still trying to add to their territory. All right, and this is again where the late 19th century, we haven't talked about it yet in this class, but this is when imperialism is gonna become popularized. After the second industrial revolution, they get machine guns and uh, Cunin and all that stuff, they start conquering the world. It's all nationalist driven for the most part. Okay, let's do um, unifications first though. So unifications. All right. Uh, we'll do Italy first. Italy, and this is a long process. Most of the fighting is done between 1858 and 60 or 61, but then it takes them another 10 years or so to get um, all of the uh, the Catholic Church papal states to join up and join Italy. All right, so we could say 1858 to 71, but the, the bulk of the fighting and unifying is done within a couple years uh, for the most part. So there's two figures that are going to spearhead this. Uh, one is, um, I won't give you the names, but no, yes, I will give you the names, but you got to tell me who's conservative and who's radical and from where. I've got Count of Guar and I've got Giuseppe Garibaldi. Who's the radical? Who's the conservative? Where are they coming from? If you can tell me as you all look at your notes right now like this. Okay, yeah. All right, Piedmont. And I think... You should give me a direction. Count, uh, where is it? Yeah, like, is it northern Italy, southern Italy? What is it? No, not Piedmont. Piedmont in the north. Northern. So that would make the other guy from the... South. South, there we go, from Naples. Okay, cool. So uh, uh, a large... Hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? Movement support is going to come from uh, northern Italy, and that's through the uh, state of Piedmont. So if you want to think of it like this, it's not exactly right, but they're kind of like the Prussia of Italy in that they're generally the more successful larger state. They're not controlled by anybody else. Uh, the other one might be Lombardy, but they're controlled by Austria. So this is kind of like the Prussia of Italy, kind of, not exactly. Um, so that's from Piedmont. And uh, they got a king, and his name is something I forgot. <coughs> Victorio Emmanuel II or something like that? Doesn't matter. We care about his advisor, Count of Pavar, who is the uh, one who's going to orchestrate a lot of this. Um, a lot of these, what's the word I'm looking for? Compromises uh, to make this actually happen. And then from the south, you have a radical Republican, radical South Italy. Uh, starting from Naples, although he's not from Naples, he just gathers an army and, and, and starts conquest that way. He's actually kind of a crazy guy. He tried to unify Italy earlier, then he was in prison and he escaped prison somehow. And he got to South America and fought wars for like 14 or 15 years there, helped a bunch of uh, um, countries uh, break away from Spain and form uh, their own uh, national identities. And then when the, uh, the, the coast was kind of clear, he came back into Italy and uh, uh, fought to unify Italy. So uh, that was uh, uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi. All right, I call him a radical. Uh, probably be radical today. 
But uh, he was a radical back then. When I say they're radicals, what, what, what do I generally mean? Like, if a person's a moderate as opposed to a radical, what, what do I kind of mean there? Obviously, radicals are further towards the edge, but like, what does that even mean? They strongly believe in it rather than looking at that. Like yeah, so they're more willing to do what? Um, make radical reforms, as in like, push um, quickly rather than gradually. Okay, yeah, they're much more, they're much more uh, likely to just, instead of like, try to change something over time, just cut it and change it all now. Uh, they're also more likely to be violent, too, because they believe that they have the answer, they'll they'll kind of uh, push away anybody that says otherwise. So they're not really known for being compromising reformers, more so for like action, change, and, and, and let's see what happens. All right, so again, uh, you'd actually probably agree with most of this guy's views, but back then it was radical uh, to want a, a, uh, a society of people that all voted for themselves and there was no king and no church in the state. Like that was pretty radical for its time. Uh, so he wanted all that gone. So he's a, a radical, uh, Democratic Republican. Oh, by the way, I told you this way earlier in the year, but you probably forgot. And I don't blame you. What's a republic? Because there's democracy and republic, and they're actually not the same thing. Although republics are often democratic. Do you know? Or are you just scratch the back of your neck? Yeah. Good neck scratch. It's like, <laughs> not me. It's basically where the people elect, like certain leaders to go to like Congress. Or yeah. Or so what are we in the U.S. here? Republic. Yeah, we're a democratic republic, right? We vote for representatives to go vote make, and make our laws, essentially. All right. So um, he uh, is also a believer in that system. So he wants like a parliament. He doesn't want a monarchy. He definitely doesn't want the Catholic Church involved in the state at all. He wants it gone, removed from it. Very. That part's very enlightenment. All right. Uh, so he's radical. He wants to get rid of it. Count de Bois, though, is a new type of leader, which I think you already answered this a couple times last week. Uh, he's a new conservative. So would someone besides you, because you've answered this at least twice, tell me what a new conservative is? Because I think you guys know what conservative means. They want to keep things the same. But this is not a good time to be a conservative, though, in the 19th century. Uh, so what is this new conservative, and how are they, how are they different? How are they new? Because they're still conservative. How can you be a new conservative? Because they saw in the past how uh, like, you don't give like, the minority example certain rights, um, how they would get overthrown, so it implements little things even if they don't like it. Yeah, and they don't have to be minorities, by the way. Uh, if, if I'm talking the working class in any given state, are they the minority? No. No, by, by a number, they're the majority by a large margin, right? Uh, and if I'm, if I'm talking the middle class, even uh, the uh, property-owning wealthy class, they m might be a minority compared to the whole population, but they're definitely more than the uh, traditional elites, which are nobles, monarchs, and the church. Those guys are just a couple percentage of the population. Uh, so... New conservative uh, is this guy, Count Kovar. He doesn't necessarily believe in Enlightenment ideals. He doesn't necessarily believe in uh, nationalism, per se. Uh, he definitely prefers you know, having the Catholic Church involved. He definitely prefers nobility, because he is a noble, hence the name Count of Kovar. Uh, and he also prefers uh, to have a monarch. All right, So he's going to do his best to keep those three things. But we know, right, after the revolutions of 1830 and 48, if I try to hold on to what I have and not change anything, I'm going to be out. It's happened to Charles X in France. It's happened to Louis Philippe in France and all those other leaders. All right? So his approach would be like, well, I don't even like these things or agree with them, but I'm going to give them something. What happens if I give them something as opposed to nothing? What? Yeah, they'll be happy. I was just looking for a general answer. Right? They're much less likely to, to rise up and revolt. Because right? you'll rise up and revolt if you want something and they just say no. But if they say, okay, and they give you a little bit, they're like, oh, well, they're trying to work with us a little bit. Let's see how it goes, right? You're much less likely to throw everything away if you're getting something of what you want. So that's what they're going to do. So he's a new conservative. So his goal is to form this kingdom of Italy and make it as conservative as possible and give out as few but some uh, um, concessions as possible. All right? That's what all these guys want to do. Count Cavoir. And then the other two we're going to talk about later, Napoleon III in France and uh, Bismarck in uh, Prussia slash Germany. They're all going to be this type of new conservative that believes in the old ways, but realize they cannot keep those. So they're going to be very pragmatic and practical. Be like, well, I like this, but I can't stick to it because I'm just going to get killed for it. So we have to make some changes. Okay, he's new conservative, and he's going to lead uh, from the north. So they do uh, in the uh, 50, late 50s and uh, 1860, uh, starting from Piedmont. Uh, with the help of France, they're going to buddy up. I don't know how to do that up here. I'll just put a one because they're, they're allied. 
uh, versus Austria. And if you guys didn't know this, uh, most of this territory here is uh, Italians. It's, it's a mix. There's some German people and, and whatnot, but uh, that's traditionally what would identify as, as Italy because it's south of the uh, Alps, uh, which are here. So uh, they want to take that back. Uh, France is going to give a nice little one-up boost to uh, Piedmont. They're going to take on Austria, and Austria's got all kinds of problems because if you guys didn't forget, Austria is mostly not Austrians. It's a bunch of Hungarians and Slavs and uh, Romanian people and all kinds of Czechs all kinds of different people. So they can't really fight too many people at once because they're fighting the Ottomans, they're on and off fighting the Russians, they're fighting Italy over here, and then they have a bunch of internal problems as well. So Piedmont's gonna get the W and they're gonna expand, yay them. And they're gonna keep on rolling uh, all the way down the peninsula. Skipping one section, this little black section here. Why do you think they skip this black section if you know anything about um, in this little section here, if you know anything about um, Italy. Isn't that the Vatican where the church is? Yeah, that's, those are the papal states, right, where the, the, where the church owns. So he doesn't want Garibaldi to get there first. Why do you think he doesn't want Garibaldi to get there first? Because he's a conservative. Yeah, he's a conservative, right. And, and what's Garibaldi going to do if he gets to the church areas first? He's going to uh, take eradicate the church. Yeah, he's going to eradicate it, right, at least from the state. And he's just going to take the land, no questions asked. Uh, Kovar wants to preserve that as much as possible. Uh, and he does, of course, meet up with Garibaldi, who lands with his thousand-man army in Sicily, uh, comes up to uh, Naples, and they're going to really, relatively quickly, unite all of uh, Italy except for those papal states, which it takes a few years to get Vince to join up. All right, but they're pretty much done by 1860, 1861. It's just those papal states. All right, um, so yay them. They unify Italy. It becomes the kingdom of Italy. Here's where Cavour did his uh, new conservative work. He convinced Garibaldi and all these other uh, uh, liberals to keep some of the conservative structures, but he gave them some concessions to make it uh, a compromise, some, somewhat equal of an exchange. So here's how he's new conservative. Uh, it's still gonna be a monarchy, so it's not gonna be a republic like uh, Garibaldi wanted. There will be a parliament, but uh, there's also a, a monarch too. Uh, but that monarch ain't gonna be by himself He's or just absolute, do whatever he wants. He's going to have some limits. What do we call that document that limits those monarchs? Constitutional. Yeah, he's a constitutional monarch. I forgot to give you the last couple, by the way. I did that before I forget. You had two as well. Did you have one? Which one did you say? Oh, that's right. Yeah, you got Johan Victor. Thank you. All right. Um, so, yeah, he's going to have a constitutional monarchy. So that's kind of both. How is that both, conservative and uh, liberal? Explain it to me if you can. The Constitution limits their power so they can't abuse it, and the monarchy is still at the top of the monarchy. Hierarchy, yeah, yeah, yeah. The government, right, exactly. <laughs> monarchy is still at the top of the monarchy, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's both, right? You got the monarch, which is traditional, but it's not just an absolute monarch. It's a monarch that's limited by a liberal government that protects natural rights. Okay. Um, he's also going to... Um, oh. There's three groups of people these guys uh, generally have to make happy. Italy's not industrialized yet, so we don't have to worry about a working class. So there's no socialist working class reforms you really have to put in place here. Uh, it's not that popular yet. Uh, however, I do have a bunch of people who are the nationalists. They want to expand uh, Italy. And I got liberals. So that's a good liberal reform. He's going to uh, maintain a monarchy, but he's going to add a constitution with some natural rights attached to it. That's very liberal. Yay them. They're happy about that. Uh, he also is going to eliminate uh, noble privilege, which is actually kind of interesting because he himself is a what? Noble. He's a noble, right. Uh, but he does do it nonetheless. Uh, no noble privilege. And these are the, this is the uh, notebook 39 part, by the way. Um, he's also going to... Um, is that all liberal ones I want? Yeah, that's good enough for the liberal forms. Uh, obviously, for nationalists, he's on the path to doing exactly what they want. What do all nationalists want uh, in the Italian region? Unification. Yeah, they want, they want unification. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm doing different colors. The only because my pens are running out here. Oh, I have a blue one here. That's probably better. There we go. Nationalists are appeased. They're happy. They're made happy. Uh, by unification movements. 
Uh, and uh, that's what they're going to do. He does stay conservative, though, with the monarchy. And he also, I don't know if it's in the notes, but I think it is. He's going to make the, or was that in France that did with the church? I forget. I'm not to double check. Um, it's either Italy or France that keep the Catholic Church involved in education. I forget which one, though. I might have marked that down. If I was smart, I would have. I did, and it's in France, so forget the Italy thing. Okay, cool. Uh, that's what makes him a new conservative, and by 1871, yay. For Italy, Italians, there's a, a kingdom of Italy. You with me on that? All right, so what you want to know for that is obviously how this guy was a new conservative uh, and how he went about that. And then um, how the process occurred, right? Garibaldi from the South, radical, wants to eradicate the church, the monarchy. Count of War, though, orchestrates this movement in the North uh, against Austria uh, and the other states to uh, keep the monarchy and uh, preserve as much conservative ideals as possible. Got that? Yeah. Nice. Let's do Germany now. Deutschland. Okay. Oops. I should have been like doing this the whole time. So now we have a kingdom of Italy. Yay them. But they do give a chunk to France for help out. Nonetheless, we have a kingdom of Italy. By 1871. Okay, next is a uh, unification of Germany. So, unification. This, you could say, took place from 66 to 71, but yeah, we'll just say that. 1866 to 71. Hey, has Germany tried to unify before that and failed? Yes. yes. When was it? What was it called? Uh, is not correct. <laughs> Something Parliament. Frankfurt, 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 Frankfurt Parliament, yeah. Uh, they've already tried to unify before. Uh, but uh, it was turned down. Unsuccessful. Turned down by uh, the king of Prussia. Didn't want to be the empire of dirt, emperor of dirt, or however he phrased it. All right, but between the 1850s and 1860s, uh, the northern German states are going to do really well. They're going to industrialize quickly, lay a, lot of, lay a, lay a lot of railroads, uh, grow economically. Why do you think that is, by the way, that these northern German states, uh, who are mostly Protestant, uh, are going to be so well industrialized, even though they're not a country. What were you going to say? Just say it anyway. I was going to say it's because they had the supplies in the area to industrialize. That's true, but so did. Well, that's pretty true. But I'm talking about a different reason why each individual state despite being tiny in itself and not having the resources by itself, is able to grow uh, in this little uh, northern German uh, area here. It's mostly the north, not the south, which is Catholic and agricultural. They're closer to Great Britain, which has the supplies. Oh, good guess, but that's not why as far as I know. But yeah, access to ports would be helpful. But there's a more specific reason why just these guys do well and the southern German states don't, besides perhaps their access to water. Because they're kind of united with the trade agreement yeah, Zulfurine, right. All right, so uh, what what looked like a bleak opportunity before, now Prussia's like, hold on a second, these guys are doing pretty good. It's been a couple decades. Most of these states are pretty well advanced. There's railroads going between. They're economically successful. Um, Unifying is a, a better opportunity, or uh, not opportunity, proposition now. So, uh, in fact, by the 18, late 1860s, there's a group called the Northern German uh, confederation. They're not in a country, but they're uh, they're united economically. That Zolfrein's been going for a while. And if you forgot what that was, uh, it was a free trade uh, network where they could basically have reduced or no tariffs, and then they were able to lay uh, railroad tracks uh, much more easily in between. So the Northern German Confederation are these Protestant states up here, super industrialized, right? Not as large and powerful as Prussia, but pretty good. But the South is, is, is not so good. All right. Um, there's a new sheriff in town this time around, though. Uh, he is a chancellor, or later a chancellor. Uh, and he's basically functioning as an advisor here to the, uh, to the king of Prussia, uh, Wilhelm I. Um, why? What's he all about? What's his name and what's he all about, if you know him? Oh, the hands just went down. Like, I know his name, though. 
What you got? Is Mark and he's like a new conservative? He is a new conservative, right. Um, he's a new conservative, but he's also somebody who develops a new type of political outlook and strategy. And that's a part of it, for sure. You, you definitely got that right. I mean, I'm still getting to the point for correctly identifying as a new conservative and his name. So uh, this is gonna be largely led by uh, Chancellor, future Chancellor anyway, Otto von Bismarck. Again, not a king himself like Count Cavour, more of a, an advisor in the, in the government. But, and he is a new conservative, so I'll put that label there, new conservative. We'll talk about how. Uh, but he has a new political strategy. Governments are corrupt and need to be destroyed. No, that's anarchists. You're thinking of Mikhail Bakunin. Good guess, though. All right. Um, there's a concept referred to as realpolitik, or realpolitik, if you want to. Realpolitik, if you want to say it in German. Uh, you probably never heard it before. You will hear it again, most likely, in your other social science class, because it's kind of popular. Uh, this is basically just the idea that you're pragmatic. And that probably didn't help you. You probably don't know what pragmatic is. Um, well, do you? Does anybody know what pragmatic means? What? <laughs> pragmatic. Anybody know what pragmatic means? Don't look it up. It sounds like It's the opposite, kind of. What did you say? OK. So pragmatic is it's practical. <laughs> well, what's practical mean? I'm just. We're doing it in this like line of words here. Anybody know what practical means? Reasonable. Yeah, reasonable. It just it works. It's something that will work, right? So realpolitik is you could call it um, pragmatic. That's the best word for it. And I'll, I'll tell you what that means. Uh, or practical uh, politics. Politics. Bro. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, let me give you a scenario. Let's say. Uh, Okay, here we go. You are on a boat, and the uh, uh, you've, you've, you've hit something. You're at sea, right? No one's going to be able to get to you. Um, you've hit something, and you're taking on water. And uh, you have these chambers that kind of like contain it, so like it's not going to flood your whole ship, but it's definitely going to weigh your ship down to the point that you need to get rid of some cargo. Okay, so you're the captain. Um, you have to stay on the boat because no one else knows how to, how to direct it. Uh, but there's, you know, 10 people on the boat, all right? There's 10 people and there's you. You can't go because no one knows how to navigate. And uh, you're taking on water and you definitely have to lose, lose all the weight, lose enough weight, right? So you throw all the stuff you can, but you're still going down, all right? Let's say you have to choose between going down because you don't want to doom anyone or you choose three people to throw overboard so that the other seven and you live. Right, okay, I know. Some of you, I, I would bet some of you it's more easy than others. All right, let's pretend the 10 people are your family. All 10 of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyways. Yeah, it's like no one can be mad at me because you're all, anyways. But, uh, Notice that the uh, decision quickly changed. When it was just 10 random people, you're like, ah, just throw three people overboard. I mean, even some of them were like, oh man, that means I have to doom three people and, and, and save seven. And then it becomes even harder if you're attached to those 10 people. All right, realpolitik is um, essentially saying, oh well, uh, I can't worry about you know, my feelings in this uh, uh, situation. I just gotta get rid of three people. All right, so you just, I don't know, cast lots for it or draw straws, whatever it might be, and then off they go, the three people that got the shortest straws or, or whatever. That's real politics. So it's, it's taking whatever uh, like moral or ideological ideas you have about how things should be and casting them aside for what will actually work. All right, so uh, here's an example too. You probably have forgotten, but I'll try to jog your memory. Lenin, in the Russian Revolution when he made Russia communist, that sound familiar? Okay, he tried that communist system out right away. Right, he tried his peasant redistribution, his little factory communities, it was crap, all right? Um, at least for national production, it was crap. Um, and he immediately just had to throw that out and then adopt some capitalist policies. That was realpolitik. Why was that realpolitik? Because um, they did what was more practical. Um, they threw away what wasn't working, and 
why was it hard for them to throw away what wasn't working? Because it's like, if you're just looking at it, if you're somebody else looking at it, you're like, this isn't working, duh, get rid of it. Why was it harder? Why may it have been harder for Lenin to do that or any of the communists there? Uh, because it's what they believed was right. Right, it, it aligned with their ideology and morals, but they tossed it out because it wasn't working and adopted some things they felt were immoral or corrupt just so that it would be better. Right, that was a very practical approach. So that's, that's this Bismarck guy, and I don't want to say he invented this, uh, but he's certainly the one that popularized it. Uh, again, where you just kind of ignore things that mean something to you and uh, go with what works regardless. So this really aligns with new conservatives. How does realpolitik align with new conservatives so well? Because it's like, it's almost the same, almost the same thing, or at least uh, if you can describe it well enough, it, it definitely is. I skipped something, I'm trying to remember who I skipped. You give me that explanation. I think I got a brief. Okay. The emotional bond between whatever you believe is right being, uh, and then what actually is right or what actually is working. Okay, so how does that apply to a new conservative? You're right. So getting rid of that emotional bond about what you believe in or think is right and doing something that, that works, what what do new conservatives do that align with that? So they would have to implement stuff they don't necessarily believe in or like just okay. to make the country work better. Okay, and what are they abandoning that they do like? for practicality, for pragmatic purposes. Because you're right, you kind of give me the definition of realpolitik again. But like, how would new conservatives specifically do it? What you got? New conservatives would um, take away some traditional beliefs and implement uh, law of the affair, capitalist, or democratic beliefs. Yeah. Exactly, or nationalist, right? So they're gonna they're gonna set aside their views about nobility and the church and monarchy, uh, and they're gonna get rid of some, even though they believe in it, because he does. Uh, and they're gonna give some concessions to uh, workers or to liberals or to nationalists, because again, if I hold on to my beliefs, what does Bismarck think is gonna happen? No, it's gonna happen. Yeah, it's gonna have a revolution. He's gonna be kicked out, right? So that's the that's the real politic version of it. It's like I believe in this, but oh well, there it goes. I've got to make some changes to make sure things keep going and working. Uh, so that's exactly what he's, he's going to do. He's going to be a new conservative um, in his approach. I'm going to leave a, a spot here for uh, telling exactly how he's new conservative, and then they really quickly uh, describe uh, Germany forming. By the way, when we're done with Germany, we'll, we'll take a double break, because I'm going pretty far into this explanation. All right, um, so he starts organizing uh, a unification with the Northern German Confederation. So that would mean all these states up here that are pretty industrial and connected by railroads and economies are going to join up with Prussia. Who's probably afraid of that? France. France, why? You're right, by the way. Why? Well, you could say anybody that's not Germany, but France particularly. Why? Because uh, for like the longest time, Germany has been like a disunified weak part, and now they're like unifying and gaining strength. Yeah, that's, that's a major rival. If they're not united and they're all apart, even if they are relatively strong, it's like, who cares? They're a bunch of little, little countries versus us. If they unite, though, all of a sudden France has an incredibly powerful neighbor. They're already trying to compete with Great Britain across the globe. And like now they'd have a land neighbor that's also incredibly powerful. They really don't want that to happen. So um, the leader, who I'll get into in a moment, is uh, Napoleon III. So uh, he was actually the president of France, then he voted to make himself emperor, just like his uncle or great uncle, however it was. I can't remember his nephew or a, or a great nephew. He's, he's loosely uh, related to Napoleon Bonaparte. So Napoleon III becomes uh, emperor in 1852. We'll get to him in a second. Um, he uh, is going to also be a new conservative and someone who kind of uses realpolitik. He actually knows that France has the disadvantage versus unified uh, German states. They have better economy, larger population, better military, uh, but he think, he believes his best chance is now before they unify to try to stop it, otherwise they're doomed anyway. So uh, he is going to oppose this unification and Bismarck, who's somebody who doesn't actually really even care about unifying all that much, is all of a sudden gonna be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, we definitely need to unify right now. Why do you think Bismarck's going to be putting his foot on the gas, even though he doesn't really care that much about unifying himself? Because since Napoleon III is so against um, them unifying, that just shows that France at the time was not doing very well. Okay, that's true. 
Okay, uh, I'm gonna say that answers it differently than I was going for, but yeah, he sees an opportunity here. He sees that obviously they're afraid, uh, and he sees an opportunity to enhance his power, his king in Prussia, by joining with these guys and taking on France uh, before maybe they're ready uh, and, and while they're in a weakened state or an inferior state. So he does. Uh, they're going to uh, oppose unification of Northern German Confederation and Prussia, except this mark's gonna get a, a double bonus for this because even though these southern states aren't industrialized and weren't part of the confederation, they're gonna join Prussia and the northern German states against fr uh, France. Why would they do that? Um, out of fear from what previously happened with Napoleon. Exactly. They just remember uh, being uh, run over by uh, uh, Napoleonic France, so they're, that's fresh in their memory. Like, uh, they may be a little older at this point, but they can certainly remember it happening or have heard the tales of it very recently uh, by the late 1860s and 1870s. So Bismarck kind of gets a perfect scenario, a perfect storm here, where uh, he can provoke a war between France and Germany, or sorry, Prussia, and he can get the northern German states on his side plus the southern German states because they're afraid that France will run over them in the end. So we have what we call the uh, Franco-Prussian War. All right, 1870, and it is, uh, it's a landslide. Uh, Germany, well not Germany, Prussia, plus the northern states and the southern states work together, uh, and they, uh, they, they crush um, uh, France under Napoleon III. Uh, they do so well, in fact, that they accelerate their unification process and announce from France itself, I think in or around the Versailles Palace, actually, that uh, they are now all going to form together to form the uh, German Empire. Uh, in 1871. So the German Empire forms in 1870, 1871. All right, you think France is going to remember that one? Yeah, they're, they're embarrassed by it. They're embarrassed also by the fact that they announced it from France in Paris. And to add some insult to injury, uh, Germany takes a little, uh, a little winner, a little winner, what's the word I'm looking for? Spoil, a little spoil uh, for themselves. They take uh, Alsace Lorraine. Yeah, Alsace Lorraine, which is a, a region between the two that has a mix of German and French populations. So they're going to uh, uh, unite from France. So that makes France extra angry. And they're also going to take the territory between, called Alsace Lorraine. Uh, and that territory is going to switch hands a bunch because then France can take it back World War I. Yep. And then they're going to keep it. And then Germany's going to take it back in World War II, and France is going to get it back again. So it's going to go. I think there were some people actually that were citizens of like five different countries or something because they were in France in 1870, and they became German citizens for a while, and then they became French citizens after World War One, and they became German citizens again during World War II, and they became French citizens again after it. Uh, so those people that lived through it got to switch like four or five or six times. All right. Uh, and they're going to do that, and Germany's going to unify. So that's the significance of the Franco-Prussian War and how they uh, are going to actually unify. Uh, and we'll talk about how he's new conservative after the break. So let's take a break, and then we'll do that. So that's how uh, they're going to unify Germany. They're going to go to war against uh, France, who's trying to stop the unification, but no one's there to help France out. So out they go. Uh, that's going to be the end for Napoleon III, too, but we'll talk about him in a second. So Bismarck uh, used realpolitik uh, as a new conservative. Again, he's looking for achieving his goal pragmatically, throwing aside any moral or ideological considerations for whatever he thinks is going to work or does work. Uh, so he does have to make some reforms here. So there's actually three different groups. We've got nationalists he's got to cater to. He's also got to cater to liberals. And uh, in this case, he's got to... Uh, uh, Catered to uh, socialists or the working class, because there's a large working class in uh, northern Germany uh, when the uh, empire does unite. So nationalists. Well, just based on this, what can you tell me about uh, him making these German nationalists happy by unifying, even if he didn't necessarily want to? Unifying by uh, German ethnicity. Yeah, unifying by force, and also he's going to expand uh, German territory too by by uh, beating France the Franco-Prussian War too. So you've got uh, uh, unification itself, and uh, as well as expansion of territory. Okay. Um, liberals, though. So 
Liberals are going to want things like natural rights, constitutions, parliaments, those types of things. And he does give them some, although less than uh, most places. Germany's not super pro-enlightenment, by the way. Uh, this is an era where uh, Germans are, well, they're very nationalistic. They're, they're much more propelled by uh, idealism. So, like, this is why the ideas for communism come out of uh, Germany. Uh, this is why nationalism is so strong in Germany, because they're not big fans of the Enlightenment. Uh, they're all about idealist, utopian, romantic ideas. Uh, whether it's going back to the old Paleolithic days, living in communes, right, under Marxism, uh, or it's unifying and expanding German power because they're superior uh, with nationalism. So they're very romantic, idealist, not very enlightened. Enlightenment is going to be much more uh, Great Britain, which is why they're going to largely do better in the long run. All right, uh, liberals, they're going to uh, make some concessions, though. They're going to form what's called the uh, Reichstag, <coughs> which is their, kind of like their parliament. It's their representative assembly. All right, so that is definitely going to be at least one liberal concession, is that regular people have a voice in the government. Uh, Morgan. Sure. But you have. <coughs> you checked out. All right. Um, so Reichstag, that's going to be a repre representative assembly where, uh, of course, they're going to have their own say and participation in the government. So yay, placated some liberals there. Okay, uh, and they, they do have a semi-constitutional uh, monarchy, but the Reichstag is a better example. All right, uh, and socialists, this one you actually do know technically uh, because he's going to make some worker reforms way before anybody else. So give me some examples of that. Yep, he's going to have pensions. Remember another one? Um, yeah, accident insurance. I left my pen over there. <laughs> but yeah, uh, in the 1880s, he's going to unveil a series of reforms, which is weird because you're going to have the monarch, essentially, through the Kaiser, issuing these worker reforms uh, way before anybody else does. England kind of starts doing some acts, you know, um, uh, in the 1830s and, and onward, but they're going to be the Germany's the first country to really like implement a lot of pro-worker policies because again, uh, they're going to have a large worker party in this Reichstag called the uh, Social Democratic Party, uh, and he's going to have to make sure they don't rise up and overthrow him in a Marxist revolution. Uh, so he's going to uh, give some concessions in the 1880s, things like uh, pensions, state pensions, and uh, worker or accident insurance. You forgot what a pension was. As again, that's where when you're working, you pay a little bit into it as you work, and then when you retire, uh, you're going to collect from that big pool of money. And who's going to be paying into it when you retire? The yeah, the, the younger workers, exactly. That's the idea behind it, anyway. Uh, so yeah, those are going to be reforms that make him a new conservative. Uh, and he's going to be conservative, though, because he does retain uh, the monarchical structure, because this is all going to be headed by uh, an emperor. Uh, in the German word, but that's Kaiser, uh, you're still going to have a monarchy. Not absolute monarchy, but a, uh, a semi-constitutional monarchy. Uh, so that monarch's going to have more power and authority than most constitutional monarchies. That's going to be Kaiser Wilhelm the first, by the way, initially. Wilhelm just means William. Uh, and uh, Bismarck's going to be the one supporting it. So that is what he's all about. And he gets some criticism, and so does Count Cavoir. Uh, for being shifty, and I mean shifty as in like whatever's popular, since he's very much a part of this uh, realpolitik idea or uses it, he's just going to shift to whatever's popular. So if working class parties like social democrats are getting popular, he's going to give them a bunch of concessions. If the uh, conservatives are getting rowdy and popular, he's going to make sure that they are somehow happy. If uh, liberals or nationalists are getting uh, upset, he's going to make sure they get uh, what they want. So he does get some criticism. Uh, for that, in fact, there was a DBQ or an SAQ or something a couple years ago. It was a picture of Bismarck captaining a ship, and it basically had all these various views on it, and it said something like, oh, he shifts his views with the wind or something like that, because depending on which way the popular wind was uh, blowing, he would just you know turn it that way and adopt whatever views, even if he didn't hold them, because again, he's a pragmatist. Okay. That's it for Bismarck. So that's how he's a new conservative. So you'll want to know how he was conservative, but also how he uh, uh, placated some of these new groups that he needed to to hold the spot. All right, that'd be the Notebook 39 part. Next up is uh, Napoleon III. So this isn't unifying because France is already France, but this is definitely nationalism. We'll say nationalist expansion. So uh, already have France, obviously, as a national entity. 
but uh, one of the goals is to make France better, right? So that means improving it from the inside as well as um, expanding its territory. So Napoleon III, almost said second, he's actually gonna become president, elected president uh, in 1848 after the revolution, right? They kick out Louis Philippe uh, because he refused to make any concessions. So Napoleon III knows going into the, into the game right away, what's gonna happen if I don't make any changes? <coughs> He get kicked out, right? It's happened twice in France in less than 20 years, so he knows that. Um, but he is going to be pretty popular, right? He plays off of his family name. Uh, he's going to make some popular reforms. So some things he's going to do uh, almost immediately as president is he's going to uh, uh, rebuild slash restructure Paris. So um, the way Paris looks now, the way the streets are, how they're aligned with the canals and the sewage and all that uh, um, you know, built around the Eiffel Tower and its, its museums. That's largely because of this guy, Napoleon. So he's going to rebuild the infrastructure. I already put that in there. No, I didn't. Infrastructure. So you're going to have a lot of very visually pleasing bridges, museums, uh, sewers. You can't see those, but you know, they're operating streets, etc. Because uh, Paris got way bigger really fast, right, after the uh, after the Industrial Revolution began, a lot of people come in from the rural areas and uh, Paris is over flooded with people. So he's going to expand it and then uh, restructure, reframe it. Uh, expensive, yes, but it generally made people pretty happy uh, with the changes. So yay him. Um, he's also going to be pretty popular because he is going to greatly want to uh, expand French Empire borders. But before he's going to become an empire, to, to expand an empire, what do you have to have? An army. An army, okay, they already have an army, but that, you're absolutely right. I call it an empire. I mean, are empires headed by presidents or parliament? No, what are they headed by? Emperors, a monarch, right. So he's elected president. That's not a monarch, correct? Correct. So they had this rule, because they didn't want another Napoleon to come up, and then literally another one did, uh, where you weren't allowed to be elected two times. So he was elected in 1848, he served his four-year term, and he wasn't allowed to be re-elected in 1852. So, because he was kind of popular, what do you think he did in 1852? He didn't get elected, because he can't. So he just took over the government and remade the uh, uh, French government to an, uh, the second French empire. Uh, so he's expand, expand French imperial borders, and form the second uh, French Empire. He's the last French emperor, by the way, as Emperor Napoleon. So France is lucky enough to get two Emperor Napoleons in one century. All right, so uh, initially it goes pretty well. Obviously we know how it ended, not well. Uh, in fact, he's deposed here. When they, uh, he loses, he's captured by the Prussians and, and uh, of course he's forced to give up his spot. Uh, but he has a pretty good run-ish for a while, except for some mishaps in Mexico. Um, he's going to expand, and this is where the nationalist expansion comes in, he's gonna expand French borders uh, by uniting with Piedmont here against Austria, so he's gonna get rewarded for that with some territory in, in, uh, in southern France. I think it's called Nice and Savoy territory. So that's basically this area here. Gained uh, versus Austria, and he helped out Piedmont. Uh, he's going to expand um, expand uh, French Empire in Asia, in uh, beginning in China and Southeast Asia as well, what will later become French Indochina. So that's going to be good. However, his first major failure comes in Mexico when he tries to expand that uh, uh, empire into Mexico. And, um, and if I have my, I think I have this right, Mexico owed... France some money or territory. So when the French went to go recapture it and, and essentially take Mexico or Mexican territory, the uh, Mexicans defeated the French, and that's actually the Cinco de Mayo celebration. It's not Mexican independence. Somebody nod if I'm correct or not correct. Okay, good. One of you is like, yes. Okay, yeah. That's, um, that's where we get the Cinco de Mayo uh, holiday actually from, was the Mexicans defeating the uh, French uh, imperial force that tried to uh, take territory and force this uh, this um, 
debt recollection. So Spain, French Empire, and Asia, uh, but he's going to do uh, not so well in Mexico. All right, and then of course he does quite badly here, loses his spot. But who's going to be happy with these expand, this expanding French power uh, in Europe and in Asia? What, what group? Nationalists. Nationalists going to be made happy by this? Absolutely. Okay, nationalists. So that's how he's a new conservative uh, in this regard. So new conservative. All right, so nationalists are made happy. Oh, how do we know he's already making the conservatives happy, uh, at least in one way? I haven't given you the other yet. But there's one way he's going to make them happy. Never mind, that is incorrect. Think about it, guys. I've already given it to you. The answer's already there. Fluttering in the words said by me and written on the board. Can you identify it? Uh, by becoming emperor? Yes, how is that conservative? Because it goes back to the times of like, the first French empire? Yep, monarch, right, exactly. Monarch, French, first French empire, right. So he's conservative for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's gonna reinitiate the monarchy. Uh, and I haven't given you this one yet. He can't put the Catholic Church back into the state. That's too unpopular uh, amongst liberals. But he can put them into education. So he's going to make the Catholic Church involved in or the head of public education in France. So he opens it up to uh, boys and girls, yay. Uh, but then he's going to make it not just like a public school thing. It's going to be uh, largely uh, contributed to by the Catholic Church as well. So the Catholic Church in education. All right. He's going to make liberals happy, though, in a couple ways. First of all, liberals. So again, these are enlightenment few people or classical liberals. He's going to uh, um, sign the Anglo-French trade agreement in 1860. That's going to uh, get rid of tariffs with Britain. Why is that liberal? Just stopping the tariffs so you can actually experience or, like, um, spread your ideas. Well, it's just more efficient trade based on the free market instead of somebody controlling it, right? That, that's actually enlightenment, right? Enlightenment is let's take out the central planning authorities that think they're too smart or that we're too dumb and let's let us engage in our own trade. Uh, that's a laissez-faire policy. That's definitely going to make liberals happy. Also, too, uh, he does have a representative assembly in, kind of like a parliament, in the French government, and that's called the National Assembly. Uh, and they're going to gain increased uh, suffrage. So more people are able to vote for and participate in this National Assembly. Like It's not just you know nobles and, and rich property owners anymore. Okay. And last one is he's going to have to make another group happy. And by the mid-19th century, there's a large group here that Marx wrote a book about and inspired many of them to want to rebel. What group is he going to be catering to here? Yeah, socialists or working class people, essentially. Uh, and he's going to do that in the 1860s. So working class. He's done in the 1860s uh, by legalizing. What's the only way that uh, workers can actually try to get changes by themselves? Strikes and unions. Yeah, strikes and unions. He's going to legalize uh, strikes and unions. So that's how he's new conservative. All right, so he's going to expand France, make it better, uh, is the nationalist part. So he's going to, again, redo, I should actually put that down here, but whatever. He's going to, like, reform France to make it more accommodating uh, and organized. He's going to, of course, oh, and also to look better. That's a big part of it, too. He wants to look aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, he's going to expand French uh, empire in Asia uh, and in Europe. But he's going to fail miserably against Prussia, though, and in, in Mexico, unfortunately, for him. Uh, liberals, he's going to have some laissez-faire policies with the French Free Trade Agreement. National Assembly is going to increase the amount of regular people in it. And for working class, legalizing unions and strikes. Wait, how is he conservative again? I forgot. That goes back to the traditional monarchy. Okay, monarchy. Don't look. I know, that's the best part about it. <laughs> Okay, the Catholic Church isn't involved in the state, but it's uh, involved in, in public education, which is, I'm still gonna give it to you, by the way, for getting that answer. All right, um, I missed this, the wrong couple. Cool, that is how he is going to be a new conservative. So 
I do want you to know how Bismarck, Cavour, and Napoleon were all new conservatives, but also know how this is all centered around nationalism, whether it's unifying in Italy and Germany, or it's um, expanding uh, French power and prestige across the world, trying to Mexico, expanding in Southeast Asia and East Asia, and then of course expanding territory in Europe, and then failing to uh, here against Germany or Prussia. Does rebuilding Paris count as a socialist report? Um, I wouldn't, you know actually, you could put it in either, I think, because he does actually hire a lot of public work for it. Uh, so I would, I would say no though, just because it's a much easier example to talk about legalizing unions and strikes, that's a pretty clear, clear cut. But you could say the Paris thing was nationalism or socialism because, yeah, he does employ state, w w people with state work, right, technically socialist, but he's doing it to make the nation and city seem more updated, better, and prestigious, so it's, ki it's kind of both. Um, but nonetheless, he's, he's trying to improve things. All right. Uh, we'll continue nationalism tomorrow when we talk about uh, breaking away from imperial control uh, by Slavs and then that impact it's going to have on uh, Jewish people in uh, Europe.